Hello all, and welcome in. We're so glad you've joined us for another edition of the Book Nerd Diaries. Life can be rough sometimes, so please pull up a chair here in the library and relax for a while as we dive deep into the latest books we've crossed off our endless to-read list. Please be warned that spoilers lie ahead, and some content might not be suitable for all listeners. So please go check out the show notes for content warnings regarding today's book and discussion before moving ahead with the episode. Ready? Then let's get our book nerd on. There's nothing more universally nostalgic than a good board game. If you're like me, I'm sure that a good many family gatherings have been spent rolling dice and navigating colorful plastic pieces around a series of squares to try and make it to the end before anyone else. Everyone has their favorite games, of course. I'm a fan of Clue myself, though I'm not very good at it. But one that arguably has the most distinctive visual appeal of them all is a little game called Candyland. Though it's been a while since I've played Candyland myself, I'm sure that a lot of people can instantly conjure up images of what the game looks like. A series of whimsical, candy-inspired characters can be found along the perimeter of the board, dressed as candy canes or gumdrops. And each of these characters holds court over a specific area of the candy world you're navigating through. Everyone loves candy, of course. And everyone loves a good adventure. So it only goes to say... The Candyland has been delighting children of all ages for decades now. The fabulous book that we'll be talking about today, Once Upon a Broken Heart by Stephanie Garber, evokes that exact same sense of wide-eyed childhood wonder that the beloved candy-based board game does. Beware, though, not everything in these pages is sugar and spice and everything nice. As our book opens, bells can be heard chiming as a young man enters Maximilian's curiosities, whimsies, and other oddities. The girl tending to the shop barely heeds the noise as she promptly turns back to her work. There's a lot to be done, so what is one more customer, more or less? Next, we see our protagonist, Evangeline, as she pays a visit to the Church of the Prince of Hearts. In Evangeline's land of the Meridian Empire, a pantheon of major and minor deities known as Fates form the core of people's religious system. The Prince of Hearts, in particular, is the patron of broken hearts, and that is exactly what Evangeline needs help with. After making her way through the church's hidden door, she heads inside and sees a statue of the prince himself as the centerpiece of the room. Prayers require payment, and so she drips her own blood onto the statue as she sends her desperate pleas to the fate. Luke, the boy Evangeline had been secretly dating for a while now, is now engaged to her stepsister Marisol, and she must find a way to bring her love back to her. A boy who had been quietly crying in a pew, whom Evangeline had not paid much attention to when she had first entered, approaches her and reveals that he is the Prince of Hearts himself. The Prince introduces himself as Jax, and agrees to stop Marisol in Luke's wedding if she agrees to kiss three people of his choosing in return. Desperate, Evangeline agrees, and Jack places three marks on her arm to seal the deal before disappearing. It is dangerous to make a deal with the fate, and so Evangeline instantly makes her way back home, to where preparations are being made for the wedding. When she reaches home, she is absolutely horrified to find that everyone has been turned to stone. Jax suddenly appears next to her, a smug smile on his face, and points out that he had stopped the wedding, just as he had promised. Knowing that she must make right what she had done, Evangeline grasps the bottle of poison she finds nearby and drinks it down, against the prince's protests. 
Luke, Marisol, and the rest of Evangeline's loved ones turn back into themselves as Evangeline starts transforming into a statue herself. Relieved that she had been able to fix her mistake, Evangeline hopes that someone will be able to save her. For what seems like an eternity, Evangeline floats in a space between asleep and awake. She feels resigned to her fate until one day she finds herself slowly starting to wake again. Once she is back in her human form, she finds that she has been a statue for six weeks and was revived by another fate known as the Poisoner. When Evangeline returns home, it is to a grand hero's welcome. They believe her to be her family's savior, and in gratitude, they throw a special party in her honor. In the midst of the celebration, Marisol pulls her aside to pass along the tragic news that Luke was attacked by a wolf. This event, Evangeline knows, is retribution for her return to the world of the living. She wishes more than anything to tell Marisol the truth about her deal with Jax, but can't bring herself to. If she were to reveal her betrayal, she asks herself, would her stepsister ever forgive her? She had made her deal with the prince after all, in the belief that Marisol had put her beloved under a spell to make him choose her instead. She still has hope that Luke could return to her after finding a letter from him in her room, but she soon discovers that he had truly loved Marisol after all. Evangeline starts to doubt whether she had been wrong after all, and finds herself more heartbroken than ever. Despite her secret treacherous deal with the fate, Evangeline is still considered a hero by her people. This culminates when no less than the Empress of the Meridian Empire sends her a letter, summoning her to tea for the next afternoon. This incredible invitation is one Evangeline can't possibly turn down, and so she attends the meeting, where the Empress presents her with a very unique opportunity. The Prince of the Magic-Laden Kingdom of the Magnificent North is soon to host a very special party called Nacht Neverending, during which he is tasked with finding a wife. The Empress herself is busy with other matters, and wishes Evangeline to attend in her stead as a representative of her kingdom. Though hesitant at first, Evangeline accepts the invitation, on the condition that Marisol goes with her, to which the Empress immediately agrees. On returning home, Evangeline seeks out Marisol and tells her about the arrangement. Marisol is immediately thrilled at the prospect of going to the Magnificent North and being part of such a prestigious event, so the two sisters instantly start making plans for their journey. Little do they know what mysteries and dangers might lie ahead of them amidst the glitz and glamour of Nacht Never Ending. Dear book nerds, it looks like we need to step away for just a moment. Don't worry though, we'll be right back after this very quick break. Please don't go anywhere. Are you an author, fellow podcaster, or small business owner looking to spread the word about your product or service? Then let us help you. We offer a number of affordable monthly advertising packages in various price ranges, so if you'd like to hear your ad here in future episodes, please head on over to our page at ko slash bndpod and click on the Shop tab to see what works best for you. Again, that's ko fi dot com slash bnd pod then click on the shop tab we can't wait to work with you the novel once upon a broken heart first made its way onto my reading list because i love all things fantastical fantasy books to me are a passport to worlds where the rules of our own reality no longer apply it's so compelling to step back from the grind of our own lives and allow yourself to believe in magic, if just for a moment. What truly sealed the deal for me was that this book is actually the first of a sequel duology, 
following up on Stephanie Garber's beloved Caraval saga. In contrast to the gritty adventure of J.R.R. Tolkien's work, Stephanie Garber specializes in filling her pages to the brim with color and wonder, and so it was my honor to return to her world once again. In the name of full disclosure, I hadn't even been aware that this novel was connected to the Caraval series at all before I read it, and so I cannot tell you how pleasantly surprised I was to get reacquainted with so many characters I already know and love. Jax, aka the charming and devious Prince of Hearts, was a central character and antagonist in the Caraval trilogy. Once Upon a Broken Heart ultimately picks up where that story left off, and shows us what he's been up to in the years that follow. Due to the fact that this is a sequel, it enriches all of the previous material that came before while still standing up on its own at the same time. While it would most likely help to read the Caraval books first beforehand, Once Upon a Broken Heart does a good enough job of providing any necessary backstory that is needed. New initiates to Stephanie Garber's work can still keep pace with what's going on and enjoy her delightfully technical world without feeling completely left out in the process. Those who are already fans of Caraval will be treated to one little easter egg after another, adding to the story's sense of fun. Don't be fooled, though. Stephanie Garber's world might be as whimsical and charming as Willy Wonka's Chocolate Factory or Alice's Wonderland, there's also a deep well of darkness that runs underneath it all. None of the characters in this story are truly innocent or heroic, but willing to do whatever it takes to get what they want. In this story, everyone's a player on a grand chessboard, and if a pawn or two needs to be sacrificed along the way for the greater good, then so be it. As always, I will reiterate here that some content in this book might not be for everyone, so please take a look at the content warnings in our show notes if you plan on reading it for yourself. It is here, dear fellow book nerds, that our discussion for today comes to an end. Your visits here in the library are always an absolute joy, and we are so glad that you've joined us. Before we say farewell to you for now, however, we have some very special thank yous to give out. Firstly, thank you so much to Julie, our amazing sister Katie, and newest team member Anthony for being our Rockstar subscribers over at patreon.com slash bndpod. This podcast helps us pay our monthly bills, so we truly can't keep the lights on here at the library without your kind support. If you, too, would like to get perks like early ad-free episodes, two exclusive episodes a month, notes, scripts, our monthly newsletter, and a special role in our Discord server, we hope you'll join them. Our deepest gratitude also goes out to anyone who has taken the time to share our episodes on social media, left us a review on Apple Podcasts or their app of choice, or told the people in their lives about us. These are the best free ways to help bring more people to the library, and independent operators like ours depend on word of mouth to grow, so every bit truly helps more than you can know. Next week, Friday, July 22nd, a new bonus episode is on the way, just for our wonderful $5 and up subscribers on Patreon, and we'll see you right back here in two weeks for another edition of the Book Nerd Diaries. See you then. The Book Nerd Diaries is written, edited, researched, and hosted by me, Amber Wilchin. Thank you so much to the wonderful Astro Freck from Pixabay for the use of our theme song, The Grand Entrance. All other music and sound effects you may have heard during this episode are also provided by the amazing folks of Pixabay, so please check out the show notes for full credits. If you'd like to connect with us online, please follow us on Instagram or Twitter at BNDPod, on Facebook at Book Nerd Diaries, or via our website at bndpod.com.
www.wordpress.com. If you have any comments, questions, or ideas for future episodes to send my way, please feel free to drop us an email anytime at bndpod at gmail.com. I'd love to hear from you. Until next time, everyone, please be good to yourselves, because the world needs you. And don't forget to support your local library.